Live from Case at 12. The six o'clock news starts right now. We begin tonight with day three of the murder trial of a man accused of shooting and killing his own cousin. On the stand today, a detective who responded to that shooting and then recorded his interaction with the suspect, Edison Kataman, on his body camera. Jeffany Gray in the courtroom today with the very latest. States, is it 61? Was that the person in the back of the car you were talking to? Yes, sir. San Antonio Police Detective Tommy Hamilton took the stand today in the murder trial of Edison Cotterman, a man arrested for the shooting death of his cousin, Christopher Cotterman, back in March of 2020. Hamilton was one of the first to the scene of the shooting, which happened on West Pyron Avenue, but he was soon sent to Edison's home located on Owasso Street, just six minutes down the road. Hamilton questioned Edison in the back of a patrol unit. I asked Edison to tell me what, what had happened tonight. Why is everybody saying that you shot him? No. I've been at home. You've been at home? Yes, sir. Dr. James Fike, the Bear County Medical Examiner of Christopher's case, also testified. It is our opinion that Christopher Brian Carman, a 23-year-old male, died as a result of a gunshot wound of the head. The defense raising questions about who fired the gun to begin with, based on indeterminate findings from the gunshot residue kits that were tested. I did not find any microscopic particles containing any combination of lead, barium, or antimony on the samples from the right hand or left hand of Edison Carman. Is it possible to uh, shoot a firearm, handle a discharged firearm, or be in close proximity to a discharged firearm and not get gunshot residue on you? Yes, it is. Both the defense and state still have a few more witnesses to go through and cross-examine. That trial continues through tomorrow. If found guilty, Edison faces five to 99 years or life in prison for murder. At the Kadena Reeves Justice Center, Jaffney Gray, Case at 12 News. Turning to COVID-19 now, as the demand for COVID testing keeps going up, how do you know you're going to a legitimate test site? The medical director of Metro Health is warning of fake testing sites that give tests incorrectly or are just trying to get your personal information. Metro Health says there are two sites under investigation right now, but they would not say which ones. Metro Health told KSAT they would share that information if the investigation finds those sites really are fraudulent. Here are some of the things that the health agency says you should look out for. There's no logo on any of the organizers' materials. Uh, the pop-up tent or trailer is in the middle of the sidewalk or some other unusual location. It's not affiliated with um, the storefront or building where it's set up or with any local medical organization or laboratory. Uh, and there's an upfront cost. That, that's a, especially a red flag. Metro Health also has a list of testing locations online on its website. It says those test sites have been vetted and they are legitimate. And you can check this out. We have a QR code that will direct you to a list of testing locations right from our website. You can actually get your phone out right now at home and scan this QR code. It will take you directly to that online list or pause your television if you need a little more time. If you're new to this process, all you have to do to scan something is pull out your smartphone, open up your camera app, point it at the screen, a link will pop up. Click that and you're good to go. We also have that QR code for vaccine and booster shot clinics. It's the same process. You can also find those articles with locations anytime by visiting ksat.com. Some local colleges have changed their plans for the spring semester because of this latest COVID surge. Our Lady of the Lake University will hold virtual classes only through at least January 23rd. St. Mary's University says classes are delayed until January 24th. Trinity University will start January 31st. And UTSA says that most courses will be held online for the first three weeks of the semester. And that starts January 18th. Sad to say, more people died of COVID last year than in 2020. New federal data reports the number of deaths in the United States caused by that virus, topping more than 770,000, more than doubling the first year that the virus spread throughout the country. But what if doctors could know if you're at higher risk of death with a simple drop of blood? Ursula Perry shows us a new research project that could do just that. We came up with this a, in an analysis to try to distinguish the genes that can predict 
what are the patients who are going to uh, progress and die from the disease. These patients tend to have very scarred lungs, triggering an immune reaction very similar to the same scarring seen in patients who have lung disease called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF. If we could use the knowledge of IPF and apply it to COVID-19 to try to expedite the development of a good predictor test or maybe even treatments, then that would have saved lives, right, and times and money too. Using a simple blood test from IPF patients, pulmonologist Jose Harasso Maya found 52 genes that predicted a patient's mortality. For COVID-19, 50 of those genes are matches. So in a heat map, every column is a patient and every row is a gene. If there's red at the top, that patient has a high mortality rate. The accuracy, 73%. Basically, out of every four patients, you can predict mortality correctly in three. If you have a high-risk profile, that means that we have to be more aggressive with your care. Larger clinical trials are already underway. Dr. Harasso Maya is hoping to decrease the number of genes needed for the tests so that it could be more easily used around the world. Unfortunately, it probably won't be available for two years. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. A new at six, a reward for one of Texas 10 most wanted sex offenders, Bobby Joe Flores Jr., going up to $6,000, but time running out to actually get that money. The 34-year-old who's from Duncanville has been on the run since October of 2019. He has warrants in Dallas County and Duncanville for continuous sexual abuse of a young child and failure to register as an offender. If you know where he is, call the Crime Stoppers hotline 1-800-252-TIPS. The reward only being offered until the end of this month. One year ago today, that is when rioters took to the nation's capital, claiming the outcome of the presidential election was fraudulent. U.S. Capitol Police officers were hit in the head with objects, including metal poles. Some took pepper spray, even bear spray, to the face. About 140 officers were injured, and five people died as a result. Today, on the first anniversary, President Joe Biden delivered a speech from Statuary Hall. The president going after former President Donald Trump by saying the spread of election fraud claims led to the attack. He also criticized the violent mob of Trump supporters for threatening American democracy. Trump issued a statement in response that included false and discredited claims of that election fraud. Closer to home on this anniversary, the former mayor of Laredo is remembering what it was like to watch that siege on the U.S. Capitol. It's where he worked once as a police officer years ago. Raul Salinas later went on to have a long career with the FBI. He tells our Jesse DeGuiato the insurrection may have been a year ago, but the image is still just as vivid and as terrifying. Watching as he says where democracy lives come under attack a year ago. I was so upset, disgusted, angered, and I'm like, what's going on? Salinas, like millions of others, saw the live broadcast as mobs invaded the U.S. Capitol, where he'd worked as a police officer when he was in college. And when you saw them roaming the halls that you once walked, that you once helped protect, what was that like for you? Totally unbelievable. I really could not believe my eyes. I really couldn't. These were not patriots. Even the statues knew that these were not visitors. Salina says he wondered what if he had been one of those Capitol Police officers. I would try to be composed, professional, and do what I needed to do. A sense of duty epitomized, he says, by the officer who redirected the insurrectionists away from the Senate chamber. <laughs> and the Metropolitan Police officer crushed in a doorway. Kudos and prayers to, to, to those officers who risked their lives. I think they did an amazing job and they are true heroes. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside right now with live cam 50 degrees. Just dropped by one degree. We're on the downward trend, Adam. Yeah, and temperatures are falling off quickly this evening. Actually have been for a good portion of the afternoon because of the cold front that moved through earlier today. We managed to make it to 68 degrees at 1 p.m. Temperatures have been falling thereafter, but take a look at some of the high temperatures elsewhere. Made it up to 86 Laredo, Catula 87, Carrizo Springs 82. 
They were the last to get the cold front that has now moved through and the temperatures will gradually or continually be dropping. Look at this, Catula now down to 69, Creasel Springs 70. So there you go, there's that, that, that cutoff in terms of temperatures and that temperature drop. Already down in the 40s in the hill country, so big temperature spread out there. Everybody's gonna be cooling off though. I think down to near the freezing point and even slightly below for most of us. Right now, 55 in Castorville, 48 Mulverde, 45 Bernie Stage. By midnight, I think we'll already be dipping down into the 30s, even around San Antonio. I'll give you a breakdown of how cold it's going to get and where tonight. Even talk about our next cold front that hits this weekend in just a bit. Thanks, Adam. Students across Texas, the U.S., and Mexico challenging each other with real-world issues. We'll show you a glimpse inside the largest mock debate in the nation next on the News at 6. Welcome back, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. We know that COVID cases continue to rise. Testing kits are still hard to find, and a lot of you are asking, is this surge going to end soon? Well, tonight, we're going to take that very question to a local expert, and he's going to break down the latest data and when we can expect things to calm down. We're at the highest number of employees that are out because of COVID uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Obviously, there's a concern that now the surge is going to lead to uh, it affecting city services. Tonight, we're going to talk about how many firefighters and police officers are out with COVID and how hospitals are working to keep providing care despite staffing issues. Those stories and so much more when you, we see you tonight on the Night Beat. Thank you, Stephanie. I'll see you then. Well, NEISD hosting the nation's largest student-run model United Nations. During the conference, high school students represent different countries and they participate in mock debates. It happened today at the International School of the Americas with students participating from across Texas, the U.S. and Mexico. Some of the topics up for debate included global issues that we're experiencing today. They debate global problems, global topics that are all designed and, and prepared and, and uh, moderated by our students here at ISA. Because the conference was virtual last year, Principal Magadan says the students were excited to do this conference face to face. And by the way, in the interest of transparency, my daughter <laughs> does go to the International School of the Americas and participated in that today. There you go. All right, let's turn to traffic now. We've got some delays on the far west side and near downtown tonight. Yeah, here's Samuel King with the very latest. Sam. Steve Meyer, good evening. Let's take a look here. This is a I-10 at Woodlawn heading uh, inbound. So we're getting a good view of the situation there this evening. You can see at least a couple of lanes blocked. You see uh, fire crews there. So this is a pretty uh, significant crash there, and it is uh, affecting traffic, seeing a lot of traffic diverted over to the uh, frontage road there uh, as well. So again, this is a view from I-10 at Woodlawn, at least a couple of lanes closed off there. So that's something you'll want to uh, keep in mind this evening. So if you're traveling into downtown, you can see that travel time up now to 26 minutes, only 13 minutes uh, going the other direction. So that's definitely impacting things. Again, I-10 inbound toward downtown uh, near Woodlawn. Also, we had a crash. Uh, we showed you this a uh, little earlier if you're following on our Twitter page, Loop 410 at State Highway 151. So that travel time up to 31 minutes there on Loop 410 between I-10 and 151. Hopefully that does get cleared out soon. I'm taking a look over there at that area to see those lanes and those lanes are now reopened. So this should open up soon. But again, uh, Stephen Meyer, I-10 at Woodlawn. This is eastbound, if you will, heading into downtown. Uh, hopefully that gets cleared up soon, but a major situation there. All right, thanks, Sam. Cold front has hit us, and it really wasn't that long ago since our most recent freeze. So how cold are we going to get, Adam? Here we go again. We'll have a freeze. Yeah. It's, just, it's not going to be as cold as what we've had previously over the past week or so over a few mornings. I think most of us just close to 30 degrees in the morning tomorrow. But another freeze tonight, a brief and you know light freeze. Temperatures rebound into the weekend, back to 70 at that point, until... The next cold front hits on Sunday. It's that time of year where we see temperatures just up and down and uh, things swinging significantly, even just in one day. I mean, take a look at our high temperatures across the state. You go from Amarillo, 30. That's the warmest they got today in Amarillo to Laredo. 86. We're talking a 56 degree temperature change or difference between just those two points in Texas. Yeah, it's a long distance, but that's also a pretty steep 
temperature gradient across our state today. San Antonio, we topped out at 68 degrees at about 1 p.m. Uh, right now, we're 20 in Amarillo, Lubbock at 27, Abilene 30. Around here, we're not at freezing, at least not yet, though this north wind continues to push in the cooler drier, less humid air. And it's been a little breezy. The wind gusts about 25 miles per hour. The wind will subside gradually through the night tonight. Laredo still hanging on to 77. That's the exception. 70 Carrizo Springs, not for long. I mean, look at where the wind is coming from. Hondo just upstream 53, 51 San Antonio and 58 Pleasanton. It's not going to be long until you're down in the 50s, closer to the Rio Grande. So let's talk about tomorrow morning. Most of us right near 30 degrees. Del Rio 31, 30 in Pleasanton, 31 Carrizo Springs. I do think we'll be just a hair above freezing from Catula to Tilden to Beeville to Victoria and Goliad. But into the hill country, likely low to mid 20s to start the day tomorrow. Even Bernie 25, Timberwood Park, New Braunfels 28, downtown San Antonio about 30 degrees, Lavernia 31 in the morning. Once we get into the weekend and even thereafter doesn't really look like we have to be concerned about a freeze will be much warmer for the morning temperatures this weekend by Sunday. We're talking low 60s. That's a clear indication that dew points are going to be up again. So right now we've got the dry air in place. North wind dew points right now in the 20s dropping down into the teens later tonight. You're not even going to think of humidity tomorrow, but by the weekend you'll notice some mugginess back in the air briefly just Saturday into early Sunday. That extra mugginess will give us some damp conditions, but I don't really anticipate much in terms of real good moisture and soaking much needed rainfall. So here's the situation. You can see the jet stream just by looking at the satellite and radar map coming off the Pacific into the Pacific Northwest, dipping southward toward Atlanta and then going up the East Coast. And it's no surprise. That's where all the activity is. You see the blue indicating areas of snow, green indicating areas of rain and snow now moving into the mid Atlantic, even parts of Tennessee getting in on the snow action. Now it's moving toward the DC area. That's still to the north of us and we just don't have any Think to generate some much needed rainfall. Here's the newest drought monitor updated today. 80% of Texas is considered in drought and around here. That's mainly south of Highway 90 and west of 281, but also creeping into the hill country. This yellow area is just considered abnormally dry, but within a week or two without rain, that will be considered moderate drought. So here's our future cast increasing clouds tomorrow. Notice four o'clock cloudy sky. Once we get into Saturday with that increase in the dew points and that mugginess early Saturday morning through about midday, we'll have some fog drizzle and dampness and a few hit or miss very light showers, but I don't think a whole lot to really show for that moisture. A few hundredths of an inch here and there is probably going to be it. If you're lucky east of I-35, you could get maybe a tenth of an inch, but nothing real significant. Tomorrow, a dry day. We'll have sunshine in the morning, then low clouds by the afternoon. Of course, starting with that light freeze in the morning. Later in the day, you'll still want the jacket because we'll only be in the 50s. We're talking 55 Kerrville, even Beeville only 57 for the high temperature around town here about 53. So this weekend highs back into the 70s, but the next cold front hits midday Sunday. So we'll do this all over again on Sunday with dropping temperatures, some gusty winds, and then that sets the stage for temperatures next week with highs near 60. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right, let's turn to the Spurs right now, and there's concerns that maybe the Spurs are going to have more players on the COVID list than on the actual active list. You later. know what? It's kind of scary. They had to hire, uh, hire, sign two guys from the G League to 10-day contracts. And tomorrow, that starting lineup is really going to look different because they're going to have at least five guys in health and safety protocols. Three of them started the game last night at Boston. Plus, Trayvon Diggs just absolutely owns the Philadelphia Eagles coming up. What a fantastic finish in Boston last night with the Spurs edging the Celtics 99-97. Jock Landale turned it over on the inbounds, and DeJounte Murray helped seal the deal with great defense on Jalen Brown. Murray was awesome in his first game in 13 days with 22 points in 32 minutes. Derek White says it was great playing in front of 19,000 fans compared to the night before in Toronto when the arena was pretty much empty. And that's what makes basketball special when um, you're on the road and they're going crazy for their team and you're able to silence them with, with big shots or big plays. So um, 
there's great playing in front. I mean, Boston always has historically fans that are crazy and, and active. So um, it's good to get a win here against them. Spurs will continue their road trip tomorrow night at 6 to the 76ers and will be without Keldon Johnson, Doug McDermott, Devin Vassell, Derek White, and Thaddeus Young due to health and safety protocols. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. One day after he was added to the COVID-19 list, Cowboys linebacker Micah Parsons has been ruled out for the Cowboys' regular season finale Saturday at Philadelphia. Left tackle Tyron Smith and cornerback Anthony Brown were added to the COVID list today and will also miss the game. Cowboys second year cornerback Trayvon Diggs has four career interceptions against the Eagles. He's faced them three times and has at least one pick in each game. He was asked why. I feel like, you know, it's, you know, one of those games, one of those division games, you know, we see them, we're familiar with them, you know, they're familiar with us. So I feel like that could play a part too, you know, just playing them all these times. And the Houston Texans will host the Tennessee Titans Sunday at noon. Tennessee is playing for the number one seed in the AFC, while the Texans are playing for another chance just to get better. It's just another opportunity to go out there and um, get better, have a chance to perform better than we have in any other uh, week previous. So we're excited for it and we're ready to um, take on another division, divisional opponent, opponent that has a chance to be ranked uh, or seated pretty high in the AFC. So we're going to try to go out there and do our best to stop them. Yesterday, we caught up with quarterbacks Cannon Williams and Lucas Coley while they were training with QB coach Yale Vinoy. Cannon comes from Harlan High School and currently plays for Incarnate Word. Cardinals quarterback Cameron Mort has entered the transfer portal and head coach Eric Morris has left to become offensive coordinator at Washington State. G.J. Kinney was named the Cards head coach and the redshirt Cannon hopes to become his starting quarterback. My quarterback coach this year, Coach Leftwich, um, he was going up to Washington State with Coach Morris, but he decided to come back and stay as the offensive coordinator. So I'm keeping my offensive coordinator, but with a new head coach, you know, it's like a, a fresh start. You know, practice, practice is going to be different every day, the schedule different, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's really a blank slate for me. Lucas played his senior season at Cornerstone Christian before leaving for the Arkansas Razorbacks. He decided to redshirt his freshman campaign and make some money via the name, image, and likeness rights. NIL has offered you know a bunch of blessings to college athletes all over the world. People with like big platforms on social media and be able to profit off of them. And for for me personally, you know, my best one right now is JJ's Grill. It's a it's a restaurant down there in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and you know they're taking care of me. I'm taking care of them, and that's a family up there. Both have big right arms, and both did you notice similar hairstyles? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I love the fact that one of the quarterbacks' name is Cannon. Cannon. It's love just, it. It's appropriate. It is yeah. indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Our KSAP Q&A with Dr. Ruth Berggren is next. Separating the COVID facts from the fiction, it's what we have been doing with Dr. Ruth Berggren from UT Health San Antonio, the Long School of Medicine. She is a specialist uh, in uh, in um, infectious, infectious diseases, <laughs> and she has been with us from the beginning of this pandemic, really. And, and Dr. Bergeron, the mayor was on yesterday. He talked about the fact that he is concerned about just how contagious the Omicron variant is and that it could impact police and fire and some city services. Is that really the big thing about Omicron is just how contagious it is? Uh, that's part of it, Steve. Um, we really do worry about not just the firefighters and the police officers, but also the doctors and nurses, because do in vaccinated doctors and nurses are getting symptomatic from Omicron. And when that happens, we have to take them out of circulation to protect the sick people in the hospital. So um, workforces are being affected. Uh, that is that is not a hypothetical, it's already happening. And we need to do everything we can to double down and make sure that we keep our society functioning, which means keeping all of our frontline workers, whatever frontline worker may be, um, in, in good health. It seems like right now, because of how contagious this variant is, everybody knows somebody who is dealing with COVID. So what have we learned about whether an infection actually getting COVID could help protect you from the next time you're exposed to COVID? Well, thanks, thanks for asking that question because there is a little nugget that I want to share with our viewers. Um, previously, 
we were quoted that with a prior infection, you had maybe up to an 85% protection from like the Delta variant. And that was particularly true for the first three months or so after your infection. Um, it didn't seem to last very long, but there was evidence of maybe 85% protection from prior infection. Well, guess what? Omicron is a whole new ball game. Your protection from prior infection has fallen down as low as 19%. So from 85% protection for a few months down to 19%. Do not count on your prior COVID infection to protect you from Omicron. Uh, to be protected from Omicron, you need to be fully vaccinated and boosted. As a doctor, how concerned are you when you see a lack of at-home tests, when you see six-hour waits for some of the drive-through locations that we've seen here in town over the last few days, that, that, that people are just having trouble even getting tested to tell if they have COVID or not? How concerning is that for you as a doctor? I think it is problematic, but remember that we have guidelines that tell us what to do based on exposure to infection and guidelines that tell us what to do based on having mild symptoms. So if you've been exposed uh, or if you have mild symptoms, even if you can't get a test or you don't have the patience or the stamina to wait in line for the test, you know what to do. You put your mask on and you isolate yourself and certainly try to get tested to confirm whether or not it's COVID so you know what else you may need to do for yourself. Um, but we don't need to panic about it, right? We need to use a lot of common sense. If you've had an exposure, you're unvaccinated, you do need to go home and you need to quarantine. If you are symptomatic and you can't get a test, but you think you've got COVID based on loss of smell or feeling achy or cough, put your mask on and take yourself out of circulation. That's gonna do a lot of good, even if the tests aren't available. Now, having said all that, I would love to see widespread spread availability of free tests available for everybody so that we could be using these tests on a regular basis to monitor ourselves, make sure it's safe for children to go to school and for frontline workers to show up on the job without risking infecting everybody else. You mentioned the isolation and the quarantining. There's been some recent changes to the guidelines on that. So can you explain to people if they do come down with COVID, what's recommended right now in terms of how to handle that? <clears throat> right, so there's actually been a shortening of the duration of isolation if you have mild or asymptomatic COVID. Um, mild or asymptomatic COVID requires a five-day isolation. You may return to work after your symptoms have largely resolved if five days have elapsed since your first symptom and you've had no fever for 24 hours without using fever lowering medication. Have you been looking at trends? I know, I know you may not have the same survey per se that you had in the past, but are you looking at trends for how long you think the surge will last? So we do not have the same SG2 model that I used to share all the time. We're not using that anymore, but we have opinion and we have a lot of learned scientists and epidemiologists who are looking at the epidemic curves in South Africa, uh, in the UK. And what we're seeing with this variant is a steep rise and then a fairly steep drop off. And we are of the opinion, and opinions are just that, they're opinions. Uh, at the Health Science Center, our opinion is that we'll probably see a peak in about mid-January we expect it to steeply drop off, and we hope to be back to our prior baseline sometime in the first week of February. So we don't expect it to be as long-lived as, uh, say, the Delta surge that we had. We heard from city and county leaders asking for more remdesivir to be made available here locally at our infusion centers. We know that there have been developments in therapies and pills you can take treatments for COVID-19. So can you talk about what is available right now and who can actually take that? Right, so we're in a uh, strange window of time where we had great news in late December about the approval or emergency use approval of two different kinds of pills. One was called Molnupiravir and the other is called Paxlovid. It's uh, five or six pills that you have to take twice daily for five days with 
um, pretty good outcomes in terms of preventing people from getting sicker and having to go to the hospital. Wonderful advances. Here's the problem, Steve and Myra. These drugs are not widely available. In fact, it's a little bit, I as an infectious disease doctor feel like it's an Easter egg hunt. If I've got a sick person who needs outpatient therapy, um, there is a website that doctors can go to uh, to identify where the supplies are, but supplies are extremely limited. This is a problem with a capital P because it happens that in addition, the monoclonal antibody outpatient treatment called satrivimab, um, which is also very good at preventing people from getting sicker, those monoclonal antibodies are virtually completely depleted um, in the San Antonio area through much of Texas and really throughout the country. So we've got great progress with treatments and the treatments are unavailable right when we're having a surge. So what do we do? Well, a recently published study in the New England Journal of Medicine showed that the intravenous drug called remdesivir, which by the way, we've been using almost since the beginning of the pandemic to treat sick people with COVID-19 in the hospital, we now know from data that we can use IV remdesivir infusions for people that aren't sick enough to be in the hospital. And if we could arrange for them to get these infusions in outpatient centers, we know from the data that we can do a lot of good in preventing progression of the illness and we can prevent people from getting sick, from going to the hospital, and even from dying. So where's the problem? Well, there's some logistical concerns about giving people an infusion every day for three days when they're coming to an outpatient setting. That's one. That's not insurmountable, though. What's harder is that remdesivir is not on an emergency use basis anymore. It's been fully FDA approved, mm -hmm. which means that our federal government is not distributing remdesivir for free to emergency response teams in the same way that the government is distributing the monoclonal antibody. So we need that to change. We need it to change and we need all hands on deck. Um, I've been contacting um, my representative of Congress, uh, making phone calls, sending emails, um, advocating so that uh, people in San Antonio and throughout Texas can get access to truly a life-saving treatment in this interim period while we wait for the pills and the monoclonals to be available in greater supply. Infectious disease doctor Ruth Bergeron from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Always appreciate your time. Thank you. Glad to be with you. We'll be right back. Hi everyone, just some uh, reminders about construction once again. We have the alternating lane closures uh, before the new year. We had them west of I-10. Right now they are east of I-10. So between 281 and Vance Jackson, if you're on this stretch of 1604 overnights this week, you'll notice some alternating closures in both directions as uh, this project uh, continues. Also some closures in and around uh, the Blanco Road area in 1604 overnights. So watch out for that as well. If you live in that area, well aware of that. But if you're traveling through, just keep that in mind. Also some alternating closures here once again on 281 between uh, Stone Oak and 1604. Uh, right now travel time is looking good, a lot better than they did last night uh, at this time. And another good thing here that crash we just showed you in the first half hour, I-10 and Woodlawn, that is cleared. That's a very good thing. Thank you, Santa. Live cam tonight, 49 degrees. The temperature just keeps dropping after what was a pretty nice morning. Yeah, temperatures peaked around 1 p.m. locally and then they fell off and they're falling off pretty efficiently here tonight, partially because of the cold front that moved through. So 51 right now by 10 o'clock, 41 midnight will be down in the 30s and we are expecting a brief and light freeze for a good portion of our area. I'll break that down for you along with the warming trend to follow coming right up. This is one of those I hope you brought a jacket to work with you day. Mm -hmm. We're just keeping them handy. Yeah, <laughs> always. Myra, it's either next to the door or 
on the if couch. Just throwing it on the chair. Yeah, so don't put it in the closet. Know. Just throw it on the chair this time <laughs> of year because you're going to have to get it back out again soon. And today was one of those days. Uh, let's take a look at our data for the day today. And we did make it well into the 60s. 68 degrees, our high temperature locally, but well into the 80s around Catula, Carrizo Springs, and Laredo. It's just big temperature spread all across the state because of the cold front that's been moving southward. And the average high, by the way, is 63. You look at temperatures now, 20 in the Panhandle and Amarillo, Lubbock at 27. 30 Abilene, Dallas 35. I put the wind streamlines on here to give you an indication of where the wind is coming from. It's coming from these colder locations and moving into our neck of the woods. And so, yes, not only just because it's nighttime will we cool off, but also because of that north wind, colder air upstream moving our way. Laredo still at 77. That's one of the exceptions. Their temperature will be dropping quickly. I mean, look where the wind is coming from. And in the hill country, we're already 38 Fredericksburg, 50 New Braunfels, 51 in San Antonio and Gonzales at 48. So by tomorrow morning, I think along the coastal plain from Cuero to Beeville, Victoria, Goliad, even down toward Fowlerton, Tilden, Los Angeles, Catula, just barely above freezing. The rest of us basically at and slightly below freezing. Bernie 25 in the morning, Castroville 29, Seguin about 30, Converse about 30, Stone Oak 29, Elmendorf about 32. So a brief light freeze and by tomorrow afternoon, we're, we're only going to make it into the 50s, mid 50s for most of us, low to mid 50s that is with increasing clouds. High temperatures though this weekend will boost back up to 70 degrees, even into the mid 70s on Sunday. Then our next cold front hits and look what happens on Monday early next week. We're back down near 60. So the typical seesaw or roller coaster ride of temperatures, it's going to continue. Winds have been gusting about 25 miles per hour. They're going to subside and pump the brakes throughout the night tonight. So you're not going to have a wind chill factor tomorrow morning. I love showing this map because it's just shows the jet stream so nicely. The polar jet this time of year, nice and strong as it usually is. And that's where the main storm track is where you see those streamlines and that's where the precipitation, the snow and some rain. But now that's still to the north of us. So that moisture not over Texas, even though we could use it, 80% of Texas considered in drought. And for our area, it's creeping into the hill country and especially locations south and west, south of Highway 90 and west of 281. By Saturday morning, a 30% chance, and then by late next week, this time next week, another 30% chance. But there is the possibility we'll boost that a little bit for next Thursday. We just got to get more data and we'll keep an eye on it. So near 30 tomorrow, becoming cloudy, 53 by the afternoon. This weekend, Saturday, fairly damp. The morning dampness of fog, drizzle, a few sprinkles, and then a brief hit or miss shower here and there. Not adding up to much, just the nuisance moisture. Then by Sunday, some sunshine, still warm. Cold front hits, though, Sunday afternoon, and that cools us off again with a gusty north wind. Welcome back. <laughs> Monitor Thursday. Okay, I want to. Uh, so, I had a recent little project here with Justin Horn, actually. His daughters have been asking for a while, Daddy, can we make a thermometer? And we're like, Okay, let's just make it happen. Let's try it out, right? So let's get right to it. And this was good because they're younger kids, right? Early elementary school. You got Haley and Hannah. Look at that face. First of all, if that's not a little Justin Horn, I don't know what is. <laughs> but also the, hmm, okay, I see him doing that. Uh, let's see. Give it a shot. And then look at Haley. Oh! oh! Oh, cool. That's when the glass starts to expand. And I learned a lot from this because, you know, younger kids don't have the dexterity to really hold that glass the way you need to in the right spot, et cetera, et cetera. And so gave them opportunities. And that's how far we got. Take it slowly, step by step, very slowly, because it's a long process. And then after a little while, it was that tr trampoline looks like fun. Want to go outside? Yeah, let's go outside. Take a break. So anyway, that was fun to do and a good experience for all of us. All right, I do have a quick winner this week. It is Celeste Weeks of San Antonio. Just sent you an email, kset.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. All right, this is how I see it going. I see you teach them how to make a thermometer in order for them to let you use their trampoline. Is that what We had some fun. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it's I It's definitely figured. you on the trampoline. That's what I figured. Yeah, thanks, Adam. We'll be right back.
Well, good morning to you. We hope you slept well last night. It is Thursday, January 6th. The officer noticed the pickup truck speeding and running a red light in that area. When that officer attempted to stop the vehicle, the driver took off, ultimately running into a dead end street. Police say the driver then backed into the patrol car, hitting it in the passenger's rear passenger side. We're told five people jumped out and took off. Officers later found three girls hiding under a house a block, a block away from the crash scene. The San Antonio police are looking for a shooting suspect. They say two men were walking along Mila Vista near Calabra Road about two when a black vehicle with four men inside drove up right beside them. Police say a man in the passenger seat fired shots in the direction of the man who were walking. One of them was hit and taken to the hospital. He's expected to be OK. Police do say the other man ran from the scene. They're not quite sure if he was injured. The suspects got away. It's been one year since a group of President Donald Trump supporters showed up to the U.S. Capitol in protest of the 2020 election and a deadly riot ensued. Today, a moment of silence held in the House chamber in honor of the five people who died and dozens of others injured. Today, President Joe Biden delivering a speech from the same place where those rioters invaded the Capitol. The protest initially called to disrupt the transfer of power after the 2020 election. Infection from the highly transmissible Omicron variant is driving people across the city to get tested, and rightly so, especially since we have been encouraging individuals to get tested if they have symptoms of the coronavirus. <laughs> That is all our time. Thanks for watching the news at six. See you on the night beat at 10.